It is a good day to be in the house of God. How many can say amen to that? Come on, give God a mighty hand clap praise. Welcome everyone. Happy Memorial Day weekend. We're so glad that you came to church today, that you didn't escape. Like some of you guys watching online, we'll forgive you today, but so glad that you're in the house today versus in the scorching heat outside. We're thankful for all of the amazing men and women of this nation that are constantly fighting for our freedoms. We're so thankful for their lives today and for their families. And before we start, I just want to make a simple prayer for them. Father, I thank you for the United States of America. I thank you, Father God, because we're still one republic under God, Lord. We're still one nation under God, Lord. We're still one people under you, Father God. I believe, Lord, that no matter what the world may look like, no matter what the U.S. may look like, there's still a remnant of people crying out to you, Abba, have mercy upon this nation, Father God. And so we thank you for all the amazing men and women of service that have gone before us, Father God, and those who are serving still today, God, that you will bless them, that you will keep them, that you will protect them, Lord, and that you will always bless the United States of America, that this nation will always be known as a nation blessed by God himself. We thank you for this beautiful nation in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give the Lord a mighty hand clap praise. Come on. How many of you have ever been in a fight? Anybody here has ever been in a fight? Raise your hand. You've ever been in a fight? Anybody? Anybody? How many won? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. How many of you did not win? Do not raise your hand. Do not raise your hand. I hope that if you didn't win, at least you left the other person hurting a bit. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We all fight for something in life. We are fighting for what we call freedom. It's an ongoing battle. If you notice, the world is constantly fighting against your freedoms. We live in a nation that we have the freedom of speech, but they're trying to cancel our speech. We live in a nation where we have freedom of religion, but yet they're trying to take away our religion, right? It's a constant fighting for our freedoms. But there is a freedom above all those freedoms that God himself has given us that the enemy strives day and night haunting you like a roaring lion to devour you and to destroy that freedom. And that freedom is found in Jesus Christ. That is a freedom above all freedoms. It's the freedom that you could approach the throne of God who is a God of mercy, a God of grace, and that he does not look upon you because of your sin, but he looks upon you because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, welcome home, child. That is the freedom that the enemy hates. That is the freedom he constantly fights to destroy. In the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul speaks to the church of Galatas, and he says in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, powerful, powerful insight. This is a powerful verse if you love highlighting your Bible, you love writing down verses to remember or memorize, this is one that I highly recommend. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And look how he starts it off. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Let me say that one more time. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then he goes on to say, stand firm. Tell your neighbor, stand firm. Come on, tell the person sitting next to you, stand firm. And he says, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In verse 2, he goes on to say, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. In verse 3, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, he is obligated to obey the whole law. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, freedom is not free? Anyone? I remember years and years ago, my wife and I were, we were best friends. We went to Washington, D.C. And we went to the monuments in Washington, D.C. And there was one of them. I forgot which one it is. I think it's in the World War II uh, memorial. There's a big, big engraving on the wall that says, freedom is not free. What an irony, right? Freedom is not free. We live in a nation where we have freedoms, but they were not free. Today we have spiritual freedoms, but they were not free. It costs someone something. It costs people something. 
It costs still today something. There is nothing free in this world. You know how they always say, oh, free stuff, free stuff. Nothing is free except samples. There's nothing free in this world at all. Everything has a cost. It costs the men and women of this nation to protect this nation so you and I could be in this church today under AC without persecution. And it costs Jesus Christ his life so that you and I could approach the throne of grace by freedom. Freedom is not free. In the many, I love looking up uh, speeches that men have or women have said in the past, especially like in the 1700s, 1800s, like their speeches were like profound. They were deep. You know, like Abraham Lincoln when he gave his speech or it was people like that, right? And I found one that really, really spoke to me that goes very well with this message. His name is Patrick Henry. And in 1775, he said this speech. Listen to this. This is writing this to uh, the king of England, right? Right before they're going to get their, the independence of this nation, when they're fighting for the freedom of this nation. I know we're not celebrating 4th of July yet. And this has nothing to do with 4th of July. This has to do with freedom. Freedom is every single day. It's not just the 4th of July. This is this. In vain after these things may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve and violate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be attained. We must fight. He's doing a charge. He's, he's, he's saying, hey, if we're going to do this, and we've given everything, we've given our time, we've given our family, we've given our efforts, and guess what? We just cannot sit back. We must fight. Now, no one likes to fight. Well, some people do. But some people don't like fighting. But he says, we must fight. I repeat, sir, we must fight. And listen to this. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left of us. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that we have left. How many have ever been in a battle that all you have is an appeal before God because you have no more strength? You tried it all in your own strength. You fought it as hard as you could. We're in this series called Breaking Bad, and I don't know what your bad is. Bad has different colors, different sizes, different names, but bad is bad. And probably you've tried to fight off the bad in your life, and you've given it all you can, and all you can right now is just put an appeal before the God of heaven, the host of heaven, and say, I'm in your hands. Listen to this. I love this part. His speech goes on to say, It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, Peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gate that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand here and idle? What is the gentleman's wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or is peace so sweet? As to be purchased at the price of chain and slavery? And he ends this part with this powerful message. It says, forbid it, God Almighty. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. I've titled this message, give me liberty or give me death. See, there's no, there's no life in being a slave. So he's saying, hey, either give me freedom or take my life. I don't want it because I don't want to be a slave. I ask you this simple question, Christian, today. Do you want to live in the life God has given you or called you to live? Or do you want to live a slave to your past, a slave to the system, a slave to your sin, a slave to the things that are not of God? Because we have a choice. In Galatians chapter 5, the same Apostle Paul, now verses 7 to 9, he says, you are running a good race. We're all running a good race. 
We're all trying to strive. We're all trying to move forward. We're all trying to overcome. We're all trying to be better people. We're all trying to be God's, all the God's best for our lives. Amen? Anybody here? We're all trying. We're running. But sometimes in the race, man, your feet get tired. You get weary. You start looking at the other people that they're running faster than you. And you start getting discouraged. You start seeing that the laps go one by one and you just don't see progress. You feel like the more that you move forward, the farther you are from the finish line. But listen to the Apostle Paul. It says, we are all running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And in verse 9, he leaves a powerful golden nugget. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Why do we fight? If not to gain what we believe is right. What are you fighting for today, church? What are you fighting for? Fighting for your family? Fighting for your freedom? Fighting for a peace of mind? Can I get an amen? Amen. You know, this month I think is Mental Health Awareness Month or something like that. I saw, I forgot what actually month is. But a couple years ago, no one spoke about mental health. No one was aware. But guess what? We need peace. And only Christ can give us that peace. And because Christ is the only one that could give us that peace, there's someone who's trying to seal us of that peace. So guess what? You need to fight for that peace. So what are you fighting for today? What bads are you praying that will break? My encouragement is don't give up. Give me liberty or give me death. In the book of Judges, we see a lot of times God raises people. But in Judges chapter 6, we'll go to there in a minute, but... If you have, you don't have to put it on the screen right now, but in Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, we find the story of Israel and the Midianites. Israel had been wandering and going in places and God had given victory, but guess what? It happens to Israel like it happens to us. The more God gives us, the more spoiled we become and the less we want to recognize Him. Can I get an amen? Does that happen to you too? It happens to you too. It happens to me. When we have a need, we come to God. God, help us. God, help us. God gives us a need. You know, I don't got time for God right now because, you know, I got to deal to my business. It's prospering so much. I got to work hard for it. And we forget about the one who blessed us with the business. So Israel, the Bible says that God had given them over to the Midianites. The enemy, God had given them over to their enemy because they were stiff-necked. They were hard at hearing, hard of listening. And so in the middle of all that, Israel cries out to God. But what was the enemy doing? You see, what the enemy was doing was that they were perfect at destroying. Jesus said the enemy comes to kill, to rob, and destroy. That's his purpose. And so the people of Israel had lots of crops and, and animals, and they will raise them. And at the time of harvest, at the time that they're going to enjoy their hard work, like you and I, many times we put in the hard work, and the moment we're about to enjoy the hard work, enjoy the relationships, enjoy the moment, guess what? The enemy comes and robs them of that moment. The enemy comes and destroys all of their crops, destroys all of their herds, takes away everything from them, and leaves them with nothing. So Israel lived constant fear of the enemy until they cried out to God. And guess what? God always hears the cry of his people. God always hears the cry of his people. Don't ever let anyone or anything tell you otherwise. God always hears the cry of his people. And now we go to Judges chapter 6 verse 10. Where it says this, that God says, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. 
How many have children? Raise your hand if you have children. Raise your hand. How many? Put your hands down. How many of you can say your children are hard of hearing? Raise your hand. Only one parent. Wow. Tell me. The rest of the parents give me the secret. I think all parents could raise their hand and say, yeah, I have to repeat the things more than once, sometimes five times. Here, God is calling out Israel. He says, I gave you over to them because I told you not to worship the gods of the Amorites, but you did not listen. Isn't that the truth of all of our struggles? We know what God is calling us to do, but what we choose to do what he did not call us to do. Come on, church. I need you to help me out here. I'm preaching to myself here. Can I get an amen? amen. Especially the bad in our lives that we long to break free from. We dig our own pits in our lives. We dig our own pits. Many of us knew what steps to take, but we've refused to listen to where God was leading us. So we chose our will over his will. Does that sound familiar? Am I preaching to someone today? We chose our will over his will. And that's where everything starts to crumble. This week I was traveling and I was sharing with the team, I was watching this message from this famous preacher. Spoke about how many times our breakthrough does not come to pass, not because God doesn't want it to pass, but because our will gets in the will of God, gets in the way of God's will. Let me give you an example. How many times haven't you come to church or been out or somewhere and the Lord puts something in your heart for you to do and if you do it you see the blessing but if you refuse to do it you don't see the blessing has that ever happened to you anyone where God touches your heart and tells you hey I want you to do this but then our will gets in the way no, God, I don't think it's time. No, God, I don't think it's appropriate. No, God, I, I, I think you chose the wrong person. And so God wants to bring breakthrough to our life. God wants to do a miracle in our life. God wants to do things in our life. But our will gets in the way of what God wants to do. And that's where we see that God has given us free will. Because if God controlled everything we did, we wouldn't have free will. Right? But when you are aligned to God's will and you submit your will to his will, nothing can stand in the way. Church, I came to tell you that the choice is ours. As simple as it may sound, guess what? We always choose the opposite of what we truly need. Can I get an amen? Amen. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, I read this at the beginning of the series. He expresses this struggle so eloquently. He says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do and what I hate, I do. Anyone here identify with Paul? What I want to do, I don't do and what I hate, I do. Anybody here? Come on. There's no sinners in the house. Praise the Lord. Church, come, Jesus, come for your church already. There's no sinners in the house. Hallelujah. Everyone in this house should be raising their hand because you don't do what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Guess what? You do. And that happens when we choose our will over his will. Let me say that one more time. That happens when we choose our will over his will. And so what happens at that moment is that we, when we constantly choose to listen and obey that versus obeying the voice of God, we don't see the hand of God move in our lives, and so we start complaining. And that's what happened to Israel. Israel obeyed the gods of the Amorites versus the God of Israel that delivered them from the hands of Egypt. And so they find themselves now oppressed, and they cry out to God, and God visits them. And he lifts up someone named Gideon. Say with me, Gideon. Gideon and Israel 
hid from the Midianites because all of their hard work was taken from them at the time of harvest. It was a curse upon them because of their disobedience. Why? Because you, he said, you have not listened to me. Gideon, as he was hiding, God shows up. And I love this story. Stay with me. As Gideon was hiding, God shows up. And you're going to see this in a couple seconds in, in, in the screens. The reason why I say this is because many of us have been hiding from God in areas of our lives. But I came to tell you, God shows up even in the darkest parts of your life. God is not ignorant to the deepest parts of your life that only you know. He's there. Because the psalmist said that even in darkness, you are still light. Where would I go from your presence? If I put my, my bed in hell, there you will be with me. God is everywhere. Stop trying to hide from him because guess what? He shows up. So Gideon is hiding and he is in a wine press, but he's not pressing grapes to make wine. He is threshing wheat because he is afraid of the enemy. So he is doing the right thing in the wrong place. That will preach to someone today. In Judges chapter 6 verse 12, the angel of the Lord shows up. And said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Wait a minute. Um, uh, why would he say mighty man of valor? He's not a mighty man of valor. He's hiding. He's in a wine press, threshing wheat. Like, why would he say mighty man of valor? See, when God shows up, he would never remind you of where you've been. But he will always call you to where you should be. He would never speak down to you and say, you did this, you did that, how dare you? Even when he spoke to Israel, he told them, because you have not listened to me. But then he responds by sending an angel to Gideon. Church, I don't know where you find yourself today, but I came to tell you that God will show up and shows up right where you're at. Right where you're at. The God we serve understands the past. But he has also already been in our future. So when God calls Gideon, he does not mention, what are you doing here? Instead, he says, the Lord is with you. You mighty man of valor. Some of you in this place have been hiding because life has beaten you up. Circumstances have beaten you up. You yourself have beaten yourself up because of the bad in your life. But I came to tell you, God Almighty is showing up today in your hiding place and he's calling you out. He's calling you out and he's saying, the Lord is with you. You mighty man of valor. You mighty woman of valor. He's calling you out. Because in order for him to do something in your life, he needs to get you out of where you're at today. See, the prodigal son needed to come to his senses and go back home so he could rediscover what redemption was. Redemption was not going to happen to him in the middle of the pigs. Redemption was going to come when he came to the father's house. So God meets you where you're at, but he says, come. You mighty man of valor. You mighty woman of valor. Today's Gideons are the same as yesterday's. We doubt. Who? Who, me? Wait, 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 Pastor Eric, who, me? Listen to this. Gideon doubted when he heard the angel, and he says in verse 13, it goes on to say, Gideon said to him, oh, Lord, if the Lord is with us. He's like questioning now this, you know, like this whole thing, like me, mighty man, you with us. If the Lord is with us, why then has this all happened to us? Does that sound familiar? How we question God? If you're really with me, God, why is this bad happening? If you're with me, God, why isn't it turning around? If you're with me, God, why don't I see my miracle? 
But it goes on to say, and where were all this miracle that our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us out from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, you see, God is not going to fight with you. Some of us love to fight. You know, we love to fight. And when it comes to God, we think that God is going to fight with us. God does not need to fight with us. God does not need to ex explain himself to us. God just needs to call us out and point us in the direction where he wants us to go. And so that's what he does with Gideon. He says, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Like saying, I the Lord, the same thing that he told Moses, I am who I am. But why? How will it happen? Me, are you sure? I've tried multiple times. I haven't seen it. And the Lord tells him, have I not sent you? Here is where Gideon has to choose either his will or God's will. He has to choose his will and stay, and stay in a wine press threshing wheat or God's will have I not sent you to go and deliver my people from the hands of the Midianites our reasoning at times can become our worst enemy we reason too much why why try if we've tried so many times it hasn't happened let me tell you something as much as I could go into my past and undo a lot of things and make different decisions or even be a different person I can't and guess what you can't either because if one thing time has is that it cannot be redeemed once it's done it's done but if one thing time does have is that it gives you a new start every day. It gives you a new beginning every day. Yesterday, my wife and I took the kids early in the morning to the beach. And um, this was not part of my message, but I think it, someone needs to hear this. We celebrated 10 years of me asking her to be my girlfriend this past Friday. And I asked her to be my girlfriend there on the beach as the sun was rising up. And probably you know the story. I've shared it a couple times. And as the sun was rising up, I turned to her 10 years ago and I asked her this question. I said, what does a sunrise mean to you? And she turns to me and she says, it means a new beginning. Why do I share this? Because if one thing we are bad at in our lives is recognizing the new beginnings God is giving us every single day. Why? Because we're constantly in the past, hiding in the corner. Not me. Not me. It can't be me. If it was me, things would have changed 10 years ago. If it would have been me, it would have, if God was really with me, why has all this happened to me? I cannot tell you why all this happened to you, but I could tell you this. You have a new opportunity today. The sun has risen up and there's a new beginning for your life today. When God came to Gideon, he didn't say, Gideon, what are you doing here? Look at your past. No, he said, get up and go in your might because you will deliver my people from the hands of the Midianite. Gideon had his questions. Gideon had his doubts. But if one thing he did is that he chose God's will over his will today God is telling you try me now in this if you trust in my will I will show you my glory I've never abandoned you I've never rejected you I've never forsaken you and guess what I'm not going to start today because today is a new beginning your bad has different names your bad has different colors whatever your bad is guess what it's not as bad as my God my God is bigger 
My God is stronger. My God is mightier. My God can do all things. Everything that is impossible for men is possible for my God. He is the creator of the galaxies, the earth, and all of the stars. He is the creator of your life, my life, and all life here on earth. He knows everyone, even those in the pits of hell. He knows their name. He knows every hair on the top of your head. Those that have hair and those that don't have hair. He knows it all. You can decide today to stop hurting yourself. You can decide today to stop letting other people hurt you too. You can move on. You can break free one day at a time. You can stop breaking, stop stop speaking, sorry, of your past and start looking forward to your future. Get vision for your life. Get vision for your life. Because if you don't, no one will. Get vision for your life. You can dream again. Those of you that have stopped dreaming because things only bad things happen to you, start dreaming again. Start seeing yourself as you used to see yourself probably 10 years ago. Start seeing yourself like that song says, open door after open door. Because it's coming. That's why I tell you, when you worship, just don't sing a song, oh, miracle after miracle, it's never going to happen to me. No. Miracle after miracle, open door after open door. Here it comes, so get ready for another one. Because another one is on the way. You can stay in your wine press or you could come out of your wine press and move in the direction that God is calling you today. Israel's mistakes was that they heard and saw the God that was speaking to them, but they chose not to listen. Today, do not make that mistake. Listen to the voice of God calling you out of your wine press. Listen. Like the speech from 1775, Patrick Henry, forbid it, God Almighty. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Joshua said first, for me, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Please stand to your feet. Apostle Paul said it very well. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We all have struggles. We all face many bads in our lives. Your bad may look different than mine, but no matter what it is, bad is bad. And God has called us. God has called us into freedom. So church, What are you fighting for? Is it worth it? Don't give up. Don't give up. Some of you need to just start speaking in faith. You've been waiting for a promotion at work and you see everyone else move forward and you're constantly staying behind. You need to start walking into your workplace and start speaking and saying, today I'm getting my promotion. Today I'm giving my breakthrough. God is giving me favor with my bosses and God is opening doors for me. Some of you have health issues that you just need to stop looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, when is it going to get better? And you need to start saying, it is getting better. God is breaking three, breaking through. He's breaking me forth and I'm seeing the healing happening in my life. You need to start speaking that upon your life some of you need to start speaking to your family upon your family instead of speaking down on your children you need to start lifting up your children instead of considering those that have walked away you need to start calling them back in calling them into the kingdom of God you need to start speaking in faith you need to start breaking the bad with your own words there's a prayer that I read years ago in the book a little book called prayers that break curses I love this little book my wife knows what little book it is I have two little books I always have there in my office this it's just a book of prayers I normally don't read prayers from other people it's just I pray my own prayers but something caught my attention in this prayer and and I make this prayer occasionally time and time again and it goes something like this It has to do with choosing His will over our will. 
And it says this, I lose my will from all control, domination, and manipulation from Satan, his demons, and other people. I lose my will from all lust, rebellion, stubbornness, pride, self-will, selfishness, and auto-submissive spirits that block and hinder my will. I break and lose myself from all chains around my will, and I submit my will to the will of God. I submit my will to the will of God. You may ask, what happened to Gideon? Well, after he questioned God a bunch of times, God still answered. Because if one thing our God is, he's a good God. Don't take his goodness for weakness. He's a good but strong God. The Midianites were over 135,000 people. And this is just the people that were fighting. And guess what? God delivered them all into the hands of Gideon with 300 people. Mathematically, that sounds impossible. What does that look like? That looks like every soldier within Gideon's camp killed 450 people each. It's impossible. Possible. He didn't lose not even one. Why? Because when you choose God's will over your own will, nothing can stand in the way. Probably your Midianite is the sickness, health problem that has been told that you say that they say that you have. Would you stand in faith today and trust Jesus that by his stripes you are healed? See, God knows the dust you might be in right now. But he can use that dust for his glory. Don't underestimate or undermine the wine presses you are in. But also don't stay inside them. Because God is calling you out so you can live out the breakthrough in his will for your life when we kicked off this series a couple weeks ago I shared with you some keys some of which the main key goes connected with this message and it's key number one and it means to surrender surrendering your will to God's will church every eye closed and every head bow I'm gonna make a prayer I'm gonna welcome anyone who wants to come to the altar Today is a day of salvation. The first thing that God calls of us is surrender. Gideon had to choose his will or God's will. He could have stayed in the wine press questioning the angel, but Lord, are you real? Like, for real? Why, why didn't you come earlier? Why, why didn't it turn around faster? Where are the miracles that my parents spoke about? Why are the enemies always constantly taunting us and destroying us? And God could have probably gone into a conversation and tried to explain everything to him, but he didn't. He says, go in your might, and you shall deliver my people from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Today God is turning, and he's speaking to you, and he's calling you out of your wine press, and he's saying, have I not sent you? Oh, mighty man of valor, oh, mighty woman of valor. I don't know what your bad looks like. I don't know what situations you may be facing or may be going through. But I know this, that the same God that called Gideon out of the wine press is calling us out today. And he's bestowing upon us that word, almighty oh, man of valor, almighty oh, woman of valor. You might not consider yourself a man or woman of valor, but God does. Because what he's going to do with you and through you is mighty. Is there anyone here in the house today that says, I need to know Jesus. I need to surrender my life to him. Whether you are in the house or watching online, if that is you, I want to encourage you to do this prayer with me. It's not the words that I say or the words you say. It's the meaning of your heart that you truly believe what you are saying. That Jesus died for you on a cross and he rose from the grave. So that you would not have to live in slavery, but that you could live in freedom. For Christ has set us free for freedom. If that's you in the house or you online, say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, 
I open my heart to you. I ask you to come into my life for you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me on a cross and you rose again from the grave. And so I ask you, help me live every day of my life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to do one more prayer. If there's anyone here in the house today, just lift up your hands to heaven. You say, Pastor Eric, I am that Gideon that has been hiding. And I believe that God is calling me out today. If that's you, just raise your hand. I just want to pray with you. Is there anyone here in the house to say, I feel identified with this message? Oh, mighty man of valor. Oh, mighty woman of valor. God is calling you out today. Not to shame you, not to hurt you, but to catapult you to where you should be. Hallelujah. Anyone else in the house today? Raise your hand to heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you did not give in to your will, Jesus, when you were in that garden. You could have given up, but you said, Father, let your will be done, not mine. And so, Lord, I ask you today for my brothers and sisters. Lord, we constantly struggle with the fact that we choose our will over yours. And so I pray, help us start today submitting our will to your will, Father God, to surrender our lives, not just on Sunday morning, but every day of our lives, Lord. When the bad in us tries to rise up, Lord, let us stand firm like the Apostle Paul says, stand firm. I pray, Lord, help us stand firm, Lord, not falling back into the yoke of slavery, Lord, for you have come to set us free. Your word says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I pray for those who are struggling with many areas in their life, with things, Lord. I don't know what their bad may look like, but I pray break it in the name of Jesus. For you, nothing is impossible. And I pray break it, break it, break it in the name of Jesus. I pray for those that have been praying for breakthrough, Father God. Sometimes we get in the way, Father God, of seeing the breakthrough. I pray help us get out of your way, Lord, for you could do what only you can do, God. I pray your blessing upon each and every one of them, Lord. And I pray that this word will become active in their lives, Lord, throughout this week. And that they will see your hand moving like you were with Gideon, Father God. You didn't need a huge army to defeat the Midianites. You just needed people that were available and submitted to your will. And so, Lord, we say Ignite Church is available and we submit to your will this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Give the Lord a mighty hand clap, praise church. We love you guys. At Ignite, we believe in spreading the message of Jesus like a wildfire. Thank you for your support and be sure to check us out on any of our social media platforms at Church Ignite. Until next time, be blessed and remember the best is yet to come.